If you don't mind, we'd love to invite you a little closer to us. We might have an intimate group, and so we want to be together. Yeah, Scotty, I know you're not shy. <laughs> oh, if you learn something new, let me know. Well, hopefully we'll have a few more folks trickle in, um, but thank you to all who are in the room. This is our session on Digital Delta Wellness Funding Landscape. Um, we are not gonna start there. We're gonna take you on a bit of a journey uh, through Headstream's ecosystem research tools to how we got to this latest one. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a different approach to the session. Um, we're gonna make it pretty demo-y and pretty interactive. So thank you in advance um, for bearing with us as we jump around between different sites and tools. Um, and as I said, we, we really wanna hear from you guys as we go through. So we're gonna use a tool called Mentimeter. Um, show of hands, anybody use that before? Nice, great. So let's get warmed up with it. Um, you can pull out your phone or your device. You can use this QR code or go to menti.com and put in the code 33977806. So there should be a fun question that pops up, which is, what is your favorite Halloween costume ever? I'm a big Halloween head. So um, you don't have to say your most recent one if you didn't dress up this year, or maybe you did and it's your best costume ever, but let us know. So uh, do you wanna, oh, a couple more people getting in. Anybody having trouble? Cool. You send us photos too of your Halloween costume. Yes. <laughs> All right, they're starting to pump in. We've got an alternative clown. I don't. I would love to know what that means. Um, Juno, a cookie, gang, monster, Scooby Doo. I hope seven eight zero six is a test, but you could dress up as that some some year. Dwight from the office. I love that. My go-to is Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus. Got to. What about yours? On here? Yeah. No, your favorite of all time. That I dressed up as? Um, I, was, I was a dinosaur for, for a number of years. Um, <laughs> and then I slowly progressed to bringing back in my, um, my ability to play the saxophone. And so I dressed up as yeah, um, right. Sexy Saxman from the George Michael song. Yeah. That, uh, that had a couple good years as well. <laughs> Important work, perfect. Well, fun warm up. This was just to get you in using Menti. Um, you can come back to this as we go. This is a place where you can drop in questions, thoughts, ideas, things you wanna explore more. Um, yeah, so we'll get into it now. Um, you guys all know David already, but I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Megan. I live here in the Bay Area, and I came to this work from social enterprise, social entrepreneurship development, and theory of change development. Um, so that was how I found Headstream back in 2020 when Headstream was looking to put together an impact measurement framework and open source digital tool to support this community. Um, many of us know and love the icon Solome Tibabu, and she was who connected me. And so we'll, we built together what ultimately became Impact Navigator, um, which we'll touch on later in the session. Um, but now I work across Second Muse globally um, on our impact and research practice. So Second Muse's broader work happens in diverse applications, cultural contexts, geographies, and sectors like circularity, gender equity and inclusion, um, and emerging technologies. Many of our programs touch on all of these themes. Um, our approach is what they all have in common, um, which is Second Muse practice really focuses on uh, being ecosystem driven. So by that, we mean we serve many perspectives, stakeholder groups, and we aim to increase knowledge, power, and connectivity of the collective. Um, our approach is systems aware, so we engage with complexity. Um, and we investigate how relationships and power move through the system. And our practice is human-centered, so we design and deliver with the humans and communities um, that we serve um, through iterative and participatory methods. Um, so I share this in the context of this session because you'll see how this approach is threaded through uh, Headstream's work in various ecosystem research tools um, and kind of how they've evolved to become this funding landscape analysis. So David will share a little bit more about that. 
Nice. Thanks, Megan. Um, this is the first time we've ever visualized the four different tools together. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly walk you through these four different tools. On the top left, um, that's our causal loop systems map, which is where we started. Uh, if you follow me clockwise, um, that takes you to digital delta, which is a catalytic factor analysis. It allowed us to understand from the perspective of over 800 people where the most catalytic areas we could focus was. That led us into impact navigator, which is a tool that Megan will share and, and talk about. Um, and then our most recent data um, and research project, which is our youth digital wellness landscape, which maps over 3,000 innovators in this space and over 5,000 funders. Um, so we'll slowly go through all four of those. Um, but what I wanted to kind of highlight before we jump into that is just this notion of, of how we've evolved, right? And you can see as we go from the top to the bottom left, like the complexity has increased. But through that complexity, we've also provided different ways and different voices in which we've been able to capture. The top left um, causal loop systems map is largely academic. The, the digital delta on the far right is really participatory. And the most complex one at the bottom uses the language of innovators to map them in different categories. So let's jump into some of these. So this is a causal loop systems map. Um, it's a little small. Let me zoom in a little bit for folks. And when we were starting Headstream, um, We'll, like many programs at Second Muse, we don't necessarily start as experts in a system. And we rely on folks like yourself to really inform us and to point us in a certain direction. And we focus on complex problems that don't have you know, one simple pathway for solving them. If, if they did, um, we'd be in and we'd, we'd focus there. But a complex problem like youth digital well-being or youth well-being at a, at a higher level um, requires multiple different intervention points. And so for us, we want to start to identify what are those intervention points. Um, we brought this, we developed this map by talking to dozens of different academics, um, dozens of different practitioners in this space, um, and looping them together to understand Understand where we thought we could focus. This really helped Headstream develop where we would focus our accelerator. It also taught us a couple of things about this ecosystem. One was that mental health was not the only pathway for solving and that we dictate all of our attention to mental health. That expanded our scope to think about social technology, like meaningful connection in online spaces. It expanded our scope to think about protective factors, you know, things like self-confidence, ease with self, ease with others, um, as a way to kind of also think about how we could focus and how we could accelerate different innovations. This just takes a little loading here. But there were limitations to that, right? That was largely an academic perspective that was largely informed by, by the adults in the room, right? And that took a certain perspective that, that was helpful in us identifying and creating a space where entrepreneurs could come and support and giving us the container for creating our accelerator and the focus areas. It pointed us to making sure that we weren't just building for all young people, but we were building for young people that were having challenges with access, they're having challenge with you know, affording care, they're having challenge with not having peer support or parental or caring adult support. Um, but it didn't empower and it didn't include ownership in the voice of young people. And so what we did with our second research project, which we called Digital Delta, was that we determined 77 root factors. Some of these were very similar um, to the nodes that you just saw on the last map, but root factors that influence youth well-being. Um, so the influence of online content and personalities on a young person's identity. Um, the time a young person spends in social groups. And so 77 of these areas that we deem to be some of the most critical areas for youth well-being um, were surfaced um, in collaboration with uh, a number of young people, a number of practitioners, a number of stakeholders in our community. And then we asked over 800 people to compare if one of these were to increase, so say the time that I spend in social groups were to increase, what is that impact? What kind of impact does it increase? Does it decrease? Does it have a neutral impact on another one of these, such as the frequency of positive feedback on online activities? We got 20,000 responses to that. And then we did a simulation that added another 200,000 data points to that. And so those are the data points that you all see here. All of these spaghetti lines, as I like to say, um, that have created the interactions between these areas. And what we wanted to see was not just, you know, a fancy map with a lot of lines coming out of it. Um, but we, what, what we really wanted to determine was what were the areas that were catalytic? And for us, catalytic means, or catalytic is defined as the areas that have lots of influence on other areas 
And so that means they touch many of the other nodes, aren't influenced by many of the other ones. So they don't have a lot of inputs. There's 13, 13 big factors that emerged around three core categories. Categories that were somewhat similar to what emerged from our causal loop systems map as well. Things like balance in the content they engage with, so how young people are navigating online experiences. You know, positive relationships with parents, with peers, and social groups. And then accessible and trusted support. Um, so access to, to resources um, that, are tr that are trusted around mental health, sexual health. What this also did was it enabled us to develop a language could utilize with external stakeholders. Um, and so I'm gonna pass it back over to Megan, who's gonna jump into, who's gonna jump into our impact navigator work um, and tell you about how the language that started to emerge in the digital Delta work really fed into our ability to work with our community with these tools and build, and build these resources out so that they had the ability um, to be utilized by our community of entrepreneurs and our community of other practitioners. Let's see, this one's going to be our new mic. Um, yeah, so as David mentioned, alongside that digital delta map, um, a team of us, including my colleague Dr. Scotty Cash here in the front, uh, were working on this impact measurement framework. And so we initially started with, well, let's go out and find existing standards and protocols uh, for how to assess youth well-being. There's got to be a great definition out there. Um, and there really wasn't. We, we couldn't find anything that was really capturing the lived experience of digital natives growing up in online spaces. Um, and that makes sense. This space is evolving so fast. Um, we know the needs of young people today are different than even a few years ago. Um, so that was where we really leaned into Digital Delta, which was already doing this work to put together a solid definition for how young people themselves define the aspects that are affecting their well-being in digital places. So those Digital Delta root factors became uh, the foundation for our measurement framework um, on Impact Navigator. So what we did was we matched those natural language framing statements in the root factors with an evidence base so that the tool Impact Navigator now asks an innovator to kind of assess what dimensions their product or service is providing for a young person. And then we've translated that um, into how the evidence base from social science might evaluate it. Um, so we, we paired the root factors with a social science field called positive youth development. Um, and PYD was a great fit for us, and Scotty can talk more about this, I'm sure, uh, through the course of today. Um, but this was a great match for Headstream's philosophy and community because PYD is strengths and assets based. So it's not just looking at how many bad things are the young person experiencing, right? Or can we get less depression, less anxiety, but looking at the presence of positive experiences and features. Um, it's also plasticity informed. Young people are developing and growing super quickly, so we need to build for that flexibility and impressionability. Um, and PYD also incorporates both internal features like skills and behaviors um, with external conditions that we know affect young people like policy environment, community, responsive services, and more. So this really reflects Headstream's philosophy and community. Uh, so the tool now exists as an open source MVP that we've piloted with the second accelerator cohort um, and have tested with cohort number three. So this is what the measurement advice looks like on the site. So this example um, is an innovator, after an innovator has already told us a couple of the uh, root factors they're working on. We propose an impact goal related to adolescent development with a m method alongside of it, and then a bundle of these positive youth development constructs. So in this example, we've recommended that this person or this organization look at those three, if you can scroll back up, David. There you go, self-determination, social competence, and emotional competence to understand the extent to which their innovation is developing protective factors through life skills. And then as the user scrolls down, they can find an evidence-based definition um, and a scale that we've sourced from research papers that they can use in their own impact measurement practices. So you can see that this perspective is much more on the individual organizational level to help an entrepreneur and investors in some cases um, have a common understanding of the impact goal and methods for measuring that. 
what we're getting in return is we're getting data about the entrepreneurs using this site and also their results. So what root factors they're aligning themselves with, what impact goals they're going after. So I share that because we'll come back to it um, in the context of how we're starting to look at data coming from our different tools um, in one place. So that brings us to uh, the latest iteration of applying root factors into a new system lens, um, which is on funding. So we, we, you can kind of see this journey, right? Like we started by trying to understand a system. Um, that system allowed us to, to really start to engage closely with innovators and the type of impact that they were trying to have. Oop, can't see it yet. And then we were really curious. We were like, well, what does this look at like at the high level, right? If we were able to zoom out, what does this start to look like for us? And this is what the result was, was our youth digital wellness landscape, which allowed us to not just focus in on specific catalytic root factors of digital well-being, but to look at who were the actors in that space and to start matching that up to the different catalytic factors, to start matching that up to the different impact areas and to understand this space at a high level. I think if you think back to this morning when I mentioned that we weren't sure when we started if there was enough innovation in this space to actually even run an accelerator, if we would have to do like an open innovation challenge like a hackathon, like four years later we look at this and we see over 3,000 innovators and they are the, the specific nodes here. Um, and then there's over 5,000 funders in here that are matched with them. But, but what are you really looking at, right? What, what you're looking at is um, the work of us going into two databases, um, Candid, which you all may know as GuideStar, which captures nonprofits that have received funding in this space, and then Crunchbase, which is more of your kind of venture private sector funding. Um, we utilize three categories of key terms to identify innovators and nonprofits in those two databases. One around youth, so there's about 20 keywords like student, like um, kid, like youth that identified with that youth category. Um, one around digital, so words like app, like technology, like website, digital, and then one around mental health and well-being. Those innovators and nonprofits in those two databases that had a key word associated with each one of those categories are what we first got. It took some training of an AI system and machine learning to train the system to start to filter through. There was a lot of innovations that weren't relevant at first to get down to this 3,300. It's not all inclusive. There's more innovations out there. There's probably a couple in here as well that may not be as relevant if we were to look really closely to our mission at Headstream. But it gives us a pretty good picture and it helps us to start identify you know, specific areas. And so we can look at things like the keywords that are defined um, by scraping the, the websites, the LinkedIn's, the public sources of data for each one of these innovators to take the terminology that they use specifically. So look at something like social identity, which has over 500 different um, innovators that focus on this area. Um, they largely fall into two categories. And so these categories are really important and we'll dig in a little bit deeper here. But these categories are, are are built by clustering of keywords that are similar to each other. And so you see here that if we think about social identity, the two categories that really jump out are one on social network, social identity and social wellness, and then another one on social awareness, social anxiety and social identity. And so these categories are of similar types of innovators and similar types of nonprofits that are working in this space. If we were to do something, you can see, uh, before I jump into something else, you can see that there are a number of different categories here as well. And so there's, in this case, 22 different categories. The largest being healthcare, wellness, and fitness, adolescent school and parenting. You know, we can look at things like creative arts, media, arts and crafts, things like gender inclusion and sexuality, um, make up this map. And then there's 22 different categories. And if we were to add 50 new Data, data points, so like organizations into this, this map would completely change because the keywords would change. But some of the themes and some of the learnings of this map wouldn't actually change. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about here. And the first one that I want to jump into is to look at this map from the perspective of what percent of the entrepreneurs and the organizations in each category are funded by private sector funding. And so we look at the top hemisphere here, you start to see these red dots. And these red dots and these kind of redder areas means that those areas are higher funded by, by venture. 
the lower areas here, you know, things like self-determination, youth organizing, are funded mainly by grants. So start to pick up on a pattern here. The second thing we started to do was we started to look at you know, what percent are um, have a term associated with equity. And so not equity as in ownership of a company, but equity such as justice, a term like justice, a term like um, marginalized, a term like um, indigenous, a term like equal and equality. And so we started to map which one of the organizations had a term like that. And you can see it's the opposite of the venture funded ones. So I'll show you again, this top area here, has the majority of these are funded by venture, so private sector funding. Majority down here, funded by grants and other nonprofit sources. And then it flips. And we start to look at the ones that are focused on the types of innovations and organizations that are focused on equity, equity related, or at least have an element of equity related to the types of work that they're doing. So we map this. And I want you all to start using Mentimeter here if you're curious, I see some perplexed faces or maybe some aha moment faces and like start putting questions into Mentimeter. But we wanted to look at this along an X, Y axis. And so along the Y axis here is equity. So at the top end, um, gender inclusion, racism, inclusion, indigenous, these have almost, you know, it looks like almost 100% of the um, innovations in this space of the organizations in these categories use a term or have been tagged with a term that relates to equity. If you look at the all the way at the other end of the spectrum on the x-axis here, which is the fraction of the organizations within a specific category that are funded by private sector funding, you see healthcare, wellness, and fitness all the way at the end here. So of all the categories, this one is, has the highest percent of the organizations in that category that are funded by private sector funding. To us, that's a little bit scary. Um, that means that not only is it the highest amount of private sector funding, but it has the lowest amount of equity-related organizations in there, and that's scary. For us, that means that either we're at this transition point, as Todd was talking about this morning, and this transition point can lead us to continuing to invest private sector capital in solutions that can create the same types of systems and the same types of inaccessible solutions that are good for some, but not good for many, um, if we continue on this path. And so we got nervous when we saw this and we said, all right, well, we need to like look at this from a little bit of a different angle as well to try to understand um, this data point. So we started to look at the keywords as well. And let's look at something like app that can be representative of technology. And, and the results here are, are, are are pretty good that, that apps and act, acts as a proxy for technology is, is spent across or is utilized across the spectrum here of different categories. But what if we looked at something like therapy, which again starts to become clustered here at you know, high amount of private sector investment, low amount of equity related organizations or focus within those organizations in this end. And so that again gave us concern. Um, what we started to do was that, what are ways that we can look at, uh oh, I hope everybody's okay. Um, what we started to do was look at what are the ways that within this space we can find some patterns or start to identify some of these outliers. So within gender, inclusion, and sexuality, which again was, doesn't have a lot of private sector investment, um, but has a lot of equity focused organizations, what did we want to look for? We wanted to look for the ones that had received early venture investment. And so if you can, you can use the data here to click on um, early venture, which is 6% of the entire cohort. And then we can look at the list of companies that are working on this. We're fortunate that one of these companies is a former Headstream company, Lips, um, that has received investment in this space. And we can say, okay, let's go have a conversation with Lips. How can LIPS help us understand how a category that is largely equity driven, that is funded primarily by grants and not by venture, how can we bring more venture into this space? And LIPS is a great example of being able to do that and they can teach us alongside these other eight organizations how we might do that. We can also go and look at the other side, right? How do we look at healthcare, wellness and fitness, which is on the other end of the extreme and start to understand which one of these groups actually does have an equity focus, and how are they able to get venture funding with an equity focus? And so 8% of the group 
does focus on equity, and that's about 42 out of, or that is 42 out of 521 different innovations. So we can look at this group here and say, well, what if we convened this group and had a conversation about the state of this, the state of this theme, the state of this category, and what they're being asked by venture funders? Well, are they being pushed to prioritize profit above all else? And what we can do? There's a couple of other um, headstream innovators in here. Violet's a good example of one. Um, I believe Shock Talk, who you heard from this morning, is also in here. So how do we bring these people together to learn from them? So these patterns and these learnings are starting to emerge from this map that we can start to organize around, that we can bring cohorts together for an accelerator around. There's a lot of possibility of what we can do. We can also start to look at the, the folks that are at the kind of intersection of this section here. So who's sitting in the middle here? Who's you know, somewhat in the middle, somewhat has a, you know, a mixed kind of methods of investment, a mixed methods of, of equity or not equity in this space. And a good example of that is the education and ed tech space here. So you'll see here that about a little over a quarter have equity related terms. Um, and then that there's a good mix of, of grants, about a third of early venture, about 20% in this space. And so we can use this section in this category as one to help us understand what we might need to do to move another section like racism or gender from being from one extreme closer to the middle with mixed different types of funding involved. If you'd like to, to play around with this. Let's check out Menti. Yeah. If you'd like to play around with this as well, let's, let's look at what's on Menti. But um, there's going to be the opportunity downstairs to, um, to, check, to, to play around with this. Um, but what, what's on your mind? What questions do you all want to know more about? We know we threw a lot at you. There's a lot visually stimulating about these maps. So I realized the Menti wasn't open that time. So if, you're, if you had a thought and you want to log it, um, you can keep coming back to this. But call it out. Is there anything you, you guys want to click around in here while, we're, while we've got it open? Just try to figure out, like, is there anything that doesn't have anything, like zero percent mm. of something? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I can. Um, so, like, a, a very, um, a very direct answer to that, and then a more like ambiguous answer to that is, you'll see here that there's a number of um, a number of the funding categories doesn't have data, and what we're doing is we're taking self-reported data. And so, in Candid, to be in that database, you do you're in there because you've received some sort of funding, and so it's clear what the funding is. In Crunchbase, um, for the entrepreneurs here, like you self-report that, and so some entrepreneurs are putting how much they've raised, some some are not, and so that's a big piece we, that we'd like to correct, um, and like to have more data to be able to kind of take a, a broader market perspective of this. The other one to answer that question is, um, these were two patterns that we pulled out, that we identified, but there's probably at least you know another dozen more that if we had time to kind of manipulate the data to dive in, we could start to understand and, and see those patterns as well. So um, one of the things we're really curious about is like, what are you interested in? Because that gives us the impetus to go out and you know explore this and to look into this. Perfect, thanks. One more? Um, I was thinking on the funder side of yeah. things, of being able to identify who is connecting into what issue areas. Like, I'll just speak for youth workforce, that's the world I'm in. Um, how, where do you see Headstream as potentially creating convenings or opportunity to show the gaps? Um, in youth employment, there's like a cluster of 10 very large foundations that fund everybody, and there's a real gap, and it's creating um, programming to have to um, deny young people to participate and so on because they need additional funding. And as an ecosystem, I don't think, you know, myself included, we've been able to show that to funders that where the gap is. So, where does Headstream feel as though they could help um, identify and, and better yet? be able to push the issue and say, hey, raise your hand, we've got a lot of gaps here. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that we've been doing with our entrepreneurs is helping them utilize this to have those types of conversations with, with investors, to identify potential investors. We'd love to do that with partners. 
like you, Matali, to be able to say like, hey, let's 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 use this map to to identify who might be good connections to talk to, who might be good people to organize with, who might be good people to learn from, who might be good people to fund with. Um, we have one example of how this map is being utilized by another partner um, to really go deep in another section and. We'll be announcing this in the next couple of months, but the intent is to utilize the education portion of this map with another funder who's really excited about the education space to help identify and to convene different folks in that space. And so there are those opportunities, right, within the space, whether you're in philanthropy, whether you're an investor, whether you're an innovator, whether you're you know, a practitioner or an organizer, to find your community and to utilize this data in a way that can kind of focus in more on more than just the kind of youth digital wellness landscape. Yeah, thanks for that question. And um, the inquiry around gaps is really important and I'm seeing some really awesome thoughts come through the Menti, so thanks for using this, you guys. Um, we're getting a couple of questions about accessing these sites and tools. Um, links are up on Headstream's website, I believe. Um, and you can also play around with this downstairs. Um, we have a demo set up. Um, but there's already one question about kind of our vision for using this in the future and looking at where there are gaps is a major influence for where we can focus and leverage our support in the ecosystem. So this is a nice segue actually to some of the, the early stage cross analysis um, we're starting to look at. So it's early days um, in terms of hitting a tipping point where we have enough data points in these tools to start looking at how they compare, but the easiest place to start for us is root factors since they're the common foundation that shows up in all of these tools. Um, so what we did was we looked at the top selections that are coming through the impact nav user data. Um, so what's on the right hand side of the screen are the top five root factors that have been selected by entrepreneurs self-identifying saying, yeah, my product or service is working on this. On the left hand side are the 13 catalytic factors. You'll notice the language sounds a little different because we did some wordsmithing um, for the Impact Navigator site, but there's only one factor that's showing up in the middle. Um, so that's the access to trusted information about mental, physical, and sexual health and development. So that is both a catalytic factor and a top choice on Impact Nav. Um, I want to show uh, another example, which is a root factor that's not catalytic that is showing up in the top. So it's not catalytic because you see there's 14 outgoing and 36 incoming. That means that the users who filled out our digital delta survey said uh, this is affected by as much as it's affecting. So it's not catalytic, but it's still really important. And so that's why Impact Navigator will still give you advice about how to track and measure that goal. Um, and then here's what it looks like for the one that is catalytic, which is access to trusted information. Um, you'll notice there's much more outgoing than incoming, and that's what makes it catalytic. So uh, Digital Delta is telling us this factor will have a lot of influence on this whole system. It'll knock down other dominoes. An impact navigator is saying this is really important for youth development, so we should all still be working on it, even if it's not going to move the whole system necessarily. Um, another thing we looked at was what do these top selections kind of have in common? What do they say as a batch? Um, one thing we noticed was a lot of these goals are about connecting young people to stuff that already exists, re resources and community, a sense of belonging. Um, we wondered could that potentially be because technology is a better fit? for these kinds of goals. Social platforms or messaging services or kind of other technology plays uh, might really easily achieve some of these goals. Um, we also wondered, given our funding landscape work, is it easier to get funding to do that? Um, so maybe we're seeing a lot of activity here because it's incentivized and rewarded. Um, and of course, we always have to check our bias. You know, Maybe these root factors sound really relatable and really reflective of what the community is working on. So maybe that's what's driving a selection about this. But curious from, from you all, what are you noticing about these top ones in common? I think we might just have to move the Menti slide. Yeah, there it is. Great. And then let's look at the next one too. Great, so another trend we looked at um, was in impact goals. So these are the statements that happen in the measurement advice on impact nav, and each of them is a combination of 
three possible adolescent development goals. So that sounds like encouraging pro-social relationships and then a method, um, so through building sense of self. So our top impact goals coming up out of the site with 20 mentions out of 44 entrepreneurs, pretty significant uh, attention to encouraging pro-social relationships through building sense of self. Um, and then the other three. So there's a lot of crowding happening around aiming for this goal. And again, the, the folks using Impact Nav right now have been interested in Headstream, a part of the Headstream family, so we know it's reflective of kind of who we're already talking to. Um, but we're noticing that there's a real preventative bent in this cluster. Um, so this is really about protective factors, which are things like coping skills um, that are associated with healthy behavior in adults. Um, social emotional learning is also a, a nice through line um, and shows up in all of these impact goals. Um, but we also wonder maybe a lot of these goals are kind of like each other. So maybe there's artificial distinction and people are landing on results. Um, in kind of duplicative ways. But really what's interesting is the gaps here. So we only had one, or in the, that case, two mentions of these two goals related to mitigating effects of traumatic experiences. So we really want to pay attention to why isn't there much activity or attention on this right now. Um, and what we noticed was both of these goals are tied to two catalytic factors in digital delta, so are likely to influence the overall system. And that's exposure to hateful and hurtful content and exposure to positive parenting. So we could look at what's happening with parenting in the funding landscape, because another question we have then is, is there no funding to, to do this kind of work? There may be other interpretations. So again, a call for Menti in your own, your own thoughts, but should we look at what's happening in, yep, group thinking is totally a possibility. Thanks for that. Funding for parenting peace, like minds. So the way we search for that, right, and this is maybe a good tutorial if you end up using yeah. this downstairs, <laughs> is you find these little search buttons and particularly, you know, there's one here for investor, there's one here for donors, there's one that they're particularly useful here under keyword. And so if I type in parent, it gives us 182 different um, 182 different organizations that are working on this in space. They're largely clustered around this theme around adolescent school and parenting, logically. Um, and then we can kind of dig in here and summarize the selection and understand the space a little bit better. So about 55% are um, funded by grants. 23% um, we don't have data on. Um, and 19% and are, are early venture, so private private funding. So it gives us sense that the majority are funded by grants, but th there is some venture in there. Um, there's a pretty good split here among equity and non-equity related. And then we can start to, to dive into, you know, things like the total amount of funding, um, you know, who are the ones that have received the most amount of funding in this space and have been successful. And that starts to give us Circle Media Labs and the Trevor Project, which makes sense. Um, we can start to, you know, pull some advanced filters here. I'm not sure what, what we'll see that's interesting here, but you can start to break down by grant again. You can look at, you know, some of the larger organizations. Well, the NYU Game Center claims over a thousand employees. That doesn't feel accurate, but um, <laughs> maybe. Um, but a couple here that have 51 to 100 um, that are good kind of leaders in this space as well. Um, I'm going to risk it. You can also do this from a from a geographical view. All right, and you can start to see, um, you know, what different approaches to parenting might be across the world. I know for Headstream, we're, we're largely domestic focused, but this gives you a perspective in around the world what this looks like. Um, so there's a lot of data here that again is ripe to be explored. And I think a lot of that exploration comes from the demand and interest from you all um, for how it can be utilized most effectively. Yeah, and we have an awesome thought coming from Menti. Um, are entrepreneurs worried about trying to design for trauma given the Pandora's box that could be open and then they will be held liable? I think that's certainly a phenomenon affecting the space and also part of what influenced Impact Navigator's measurement framework to avoid that kind of clinical-based intervention requirement, knowing that we are doing DIY research tools for practitioners. 
Um, and there's a lot of risks with even discussing some of these issues with young users. Um, so I think one way Headstream could kind of explore this topic would be, you know, what, what would it take um, for innovations to meet better trauma-informed needs of users. Um, some more thoughts about that? Yeah, of course. I, I mean, I think this question around language is so critical. Um, and it was, it was, Megan mentioned how important that was when we were going out and we honestly, we didn't want to create something from scratch if we didn't have to. So we looked for all of these frameworks that um, we were hoping existed for the space. But because the area that Headstream covers is is pretty broad and because you know well-being can encompass so many different experiences, um, that is one of the reasons that you know we created something. But also one of the reasons why like there is a challenge for people to see themselves in this space and people when they hear well-being may not think about the same exact thing. That definition can be different. It can be really different. And you know from a funder's perspective, that may mean they walk away before they even get to hear what you're talking about. And so part of the work that I think a lot of stakeholders in this ecosystem are doing is trying to create as many common definitions and shared definitions as possible so people can see themselves in this space, so people that can like know where they can go for resources or for community or for you know participation in different programs like Headstreams. Thanks. So let's open one more Menti slide up, um, which is around, if you can go one more. Awesome. Um, we gave you a couple teasers of some of the ways we can start looking at the impact measurement, advice and data coming from impact nav, the catalytic factors that are going to move the system in digital delta, and then the funding map. But we're curious, what cross analysis would you want to see? What, what kind of questions could these tools answer for you that are helpful? Um, and this may be a headier question than you can think of right now, but want to plant that seed for you because as we've mentioned these are really participatory research tools, so their application really informs their, their form and what we design and build. Um, so with that thought, we, you know, we also want to pose an inquiry to you, which is um, if we were to build a kind of ecosystem report that publishes information we're finding, early thoughts on our interpretations, um, and some trends we're seeing, would that be interesting to you? It's um, something we've thought about doing but haven't kind of doubled down on just yet. So it's a chance for a light poll um, as well um, and see where demand exists. We can move that slide, I think. But maybe we've got time for one more question, which is um, I, I saw earlier about our blue sky vision uh, for these tools. Um, we ideally want to push these as open source tools. They are being prototyped and iterated and improved right now, so we haven't put a ton of like marketing oomph behind them to start sharing them with organizations that might not be familiar with Headstream that might be working in various aspects of the youth wellness space. Um, but that's certainly a goal of ours in the future is to get these um, improved versions of the tools uh, into the hands of more and more practitioners. Um, and we also really aspire to unify them more significantly and have their information be cross-feeding into each other so we can get these kinds of ecosystem insights and ultimately feed those insights back to you all um, because these are the questions that can help inform our collective direction. But do you have anything to add about where you hope our ecosystem research tools go? Well, just to go back to that initial point that where we were transitioning from these tools being largely impactful for for headstream and they will continue to be right they'll continue to point us in a certain direction but the types of questions that you asked Matali about like how do we utilize these tools as a resource for the the community right and so don't be shy about reaching out to us to engage and to find that utility for us they are intended to not be these cool little things that we created for headstream that we can show off but more of these resources for the community to utilize in an impactful way for you all so I think we'll put up our last slide, which is our kind of call for, um, if we have the, um, there we go. Yeah, just a, a call for helping us kind of build the vision for the future of these tools and 
give them a demo, give them a try out downstairs. Uh, they are, as you can tell, kind of infinitely possible in terms of all the keywords you can mix and match and combine together. So we'll be really curious for all your learnings. Um, and we can also um, follow up with you guys with uh, questions that continue to come from Menti. So we're excited to continue the dialogue. Um, but I think that's a good place for us to leave it. And we'll just remind you, we've got some more sessions coming up before closing remarks. Yeah, so we have one more impact rotation downstairs. And I'm super excited for this next session in here, which will be led by our youth consulting team. Um, so enough adults today. <laughs> Imagining what could be um, and what are a world building for a desired future um, will look like. So I know I'll be staying in here. I hope many of you will as well. Um, if you're interested in meeting some of the innovators, they will be downstairs as well. But thank you all so much for coming. And um, we have about five, 10 minutes before we'll start this next session. Thank you.